everyone to the first debut of Wibbeck Cooking Up Business. I'm Wendy Bauman, and I'm the President and Chief Visionary Officer for the Wisconsin Women's Business Initiative Corporation, better known as Wibbeck. But today I'm gonna to wear not only the hat of being President of Wibbeck, that I've had the honor of being for almost 27 years this February, 2021, but also as a home chef and as a love of restaurants and food and beverage businesses and food itself. So we thought we would do a cooking show, but also a business show called Wibbeck Cooking Up Business. And today we are so pleased with our very first guest, Sid Lally from Antigua Latin Cafe, that I've had the pleasure of personally knowing, I think Sid Lally for like almost 20 years. And after I say that, I say, and we both look so good still too. <laughs> But oh, yeah. <laughs> um, what, what you're gonna what you're gonna find with this half an hour long program and show is a little bit about business and the story behind entrepreneurs and business owners specifically in the food and beverage business and learn a little bit about their personal lives and how their journey took them to where they are to learn a little bit about their business journey specifically starting a business growing a business running a business with all the goodness and perhaps with some of the headaches too and how they handled things. Maybe we'll also reflect on this past year that was so hard for so many businesses and remains hard. And how did some of these food and beverage businesses pivot and handle curbside pickup and catering and the like? And Sadlali has done an amazing job that I've seen, you know, totally in so many different ways that will share with us. And then again, we'll give some sage advice on maybe next steps. If you're someone who's thinking about a business, if you're someone that perhaps owns a business, if you're looking at additional strategies right now to maybe accelerate and expand or to maybe pivot or just pick up some good tidbits in advancing your business and furthering your goals with your business and your employees and with your customers, hopefully some of those insights will be shared today too. So I thank you. So we'll begin with Sidlali. I know a lot about your life history and about your father owning a restaurant, and about being a little girl. And I think I heard getting off the bus and sitting at the bar stool at your father's restaurant. So we'd really love to hear a little bit about your personal experiences, even before perhaps you started thinking definitely that you were gonna start a business. So can you share? Absolutely, I would love to share uh, my journey and how I got to where I got today. So uh, you're right, I grew up in a family of restaurateurs. Um, my mother was a chef, my father was a chef, and. They have owned restaurants ever since I have recollection of memory. So my playground was always the restaurant, not necessarily the dining room, but the back area. And um, I got to grow up uh, seeing everything firsthand, like how the food arrives to the restaurant, how the food is cooked, how the food is served, seeing customers enjoy their meals as the food were coming out and uh, seeing them change their mood. You know, when they walk into the restaurant, they're perhaps not so happy and then walking out with a big smile on their face. So the restaurant industry is a, a very tough one that requires a lot from you. So uh, my parents being married and working together was an advantage uh, for me growing up because I was able to come to the restaurant and spend time with them as opposed to being at a daycare. Um, <clears throat> So um, it, was, uh, it was definitely a journey and an experience. And uh, there was a point in my life when I said, you know what, I want something different. I want to see what else is out there. I want to do something completely different with my life that is not restaurant related. So um, when it was time for me to go to college, I decided to take a different route and uh, really upset my father because you know he wanted <laughs> me to go to culinary school. And I said, well, I got you and my mom, what did I need to go to culinary school for? But you know, you do need it. <laughs> but I decided to uh, go a different route and I uh, got a degree in information resources and worked in that field for a number of years. Um, however, uh, there was something missing, you know, just uh, sitting in front of a desk, working and talking tech terms wasn't necessarily uh, a passion of mine, even though I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy it as much as having that human interaction with the customers. I didn't enjoy it as much as creating a meal and seeing uh, the person smile when they try the first bite of what you created for them. And uh, that rush, you know, I mean, uh, this, this industry is definitely a rush, you know. Uh, you either have the dining room full of people and then it just creates that rush or if you're uh, catering and you have to execute, it creates that rush. So, um, yeah, that was let, me, let me go back. I remember... Uh, always uh, playing around in the walking cooler, 
doing my homework at the bar. Um, it was just really funny because people will walk in and they will see a little kid at the bar doing their homework, you know, and I will wave at everybody and say hi. And I think that's why, uh, you know, I'm not afraid of talking to people. And, you know, I, I can approach people easily because I have that one-to-one -one human interaction. And um, I remember once my mom couldn't find me and I was stuck in the walk-in cooler, you know, just playing around, looking at things yeah. that, you know, that right. were fascinating to me. I will see this big pyrex of meat and I'm like, well, what is that really? I mean, I know it's meat, but where does it come from? You yeah. know, um, little things like that. And so, throughout okay. the years, once I, did, once I decided to go into business, you know, history is repeating itself in a good way. Good. Just a couple questions before we go on then to your business entrepreneurial journey specifically. So did you grow up in Milwaukee? No. So I moved to Milwaukee when I was uh, 15. So okay. my parents were in, in Mexico. They had a restaurant in Mexico in a couple of different states. So for my first four years of my life, uh, we lived in TJ in Tijuana, Mexico. Okay. And then they moved to central. They moved to central Mexico to the state of Michoacan. And they also had a restaurant there for 10 years. Okay. And then we moved uh, to the United States. So I was 14. And okay. uh, we first moved to California. Then we moved to Milwaukee because my dad was going to open up a restaurant. Or he did, actually, with his partner here. And um, he was a little bit, he had that whole uh, immigrant nomad mentality forever. Because even before he moved to the States, he moved around Mexico every 10 years. It was like his thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Explore new mm -hmm. frontiers, you know. Okay. And the restaurants in Mexico, type of food just overall was? Well, the first one that he had in Tijuana was uh, strictly Mexican food. So traditional, authentic Mexican food. It was actually called Gran Teocali, which means the Great Temple. And it was all decorated uh, for the Aztecs. And that's when he got the idea to name his Zitlán, you know, okay. uh, which is a very initial name and it's an Aztec or Nahuatl name. Um, so he was like infatuated with that history. So there was a lot of uh, traditional Mexican cooking in that restaurant, which was a second one because he originally opened Gran Teocali at the pyramids in, um, in Mexico, which still stands and hmm. was run by, by my previous family. But his previous family, I meant to say. <laughs> um, then in uh, Michoacan, when he opened Rey Sol, that was a completely different restaurant. It was a uh, French, Spanish, and steakhouse. So okay. it was a steakhouse with a French and Spanish uh, cuisine. So it was all decorated like uh, Versailles. You know, yeah. uh, he had a infatuation this time with Louis XIV because um, to him, to Louis XIV, the most important person to him was the chef. His <laughs> chef was everything to him. So he grew this love for French cuisine, French decor, and integrated very little bit of the Mexican flavors into it. But um, it was more of a steakhouse with the Spanish and, and French uh, flair. Mm -hmm. And it was, very, it was different than, uh, than your traditional steakhouse because mm -hmm. he built the grill himself. Um, so he used charcoal for, for his yeah, okay. cup of meat, you know, to, to grill the meat. So it, it was really good. He was very, um, he was a very well-known chef, a uh, number of awards, big shows for me to feel. He was the traveling chef for the president, for three presidents in Mexico. Wow. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, he, he was a very accomplished individual. And so was my mother, but we're, uh -huh. you know, my mom's uh, training came mainly from uh, French and Spanish cuisine. So that's okay. where it came from. And then my dad uh, did the steakhouse with that Mexican flair. So that's why he will always grill the meat with the charcoal. Mm -hmm. And then his restaurant in Milwaukee, when he opened it up, tell us just briefly about that and then we'll move on. Sure. So when he decided to come to Milwaukee, he was supposed to retire, but he didn't. So he opened up at Rey Sol. He kept the name because he just it was too, too close to his heart. He loved it, but it was more, um, or it was just Mexican. But okay traditional Mexican cuisine. So it was very different. He first opened up about 25 years ago. And back then, all we knew in Milwaukee was uh, Tex-Mex food. There were a number of very good Tex-Mex restaurants around the city. There was one Cuban and one Puerto Rican, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And then he came in and took the city by storm because he was showing people what true Mexican food was mm -hmm. that was not loaded with just cheese and tomato sauce right. or tortilla cheese, salsa. So, um, you know, once again, he accomplished many things. He was in the top 30 right away when he opened with the Milwaukee Journal. Um, 
top 20 with the Milwaukee Magazine. So did great things. And unfortunately, his health declined. And uh, he decided to close up shop six months after I decided to open up Antigua. Mm-hmm. So, okay, good. Well, I went yeah, to his like restaurant. That. I went to his restaurant. Yeah, and I and I loved it. And I could see that it was a distinct restaurant, you know, very much so. So now a little bit fast forward. When did you have this idea then right after college that, okay, I'm going to start my own restaurant. So tell us a little bit about that journey. Well, that was crazy because honestly, I think anybody that goes into, into this industry are crazy. We are all crazy. <laughs> so we were driving, we were driving around with my husband after church one day and I saw a building for lease and out of the blue, I said, hey, let's rent it. Let's open up a restaurant. And that's how it happened. And while we did really good for a few months, I didn't do my homework. I wasn't in touch with Wibbick at the time when we first opened up and um, I didn't did uh, my market research and long story short, we ended up closing shop because they tore up the street. The entire Wisconsin Avenue got tore up and the sidewalk. So I couldn't get to the restaurant. My customers couldn't. So I decided to move and uh, we looked for a new location. But this time I decided to do things right. And that's when I came to Wibbit. And then, um, you know, you guys were able to help me in more than one way that I can talk about in a little bit. And uh, so that was 15 years ago. So this year yeah. we'll be celebrating in July 15 years. 15 years. And I remember being at the restaurant also in on Wisconsin Avenue, right on Wisconsin Avenue, sort of right almost almost intersection of Wisconsin and water in downtown Milwaukee, right? And yeah, I remember being there. Yeah, so how Wisconsin long did you, Yeah, how long did you have that restaurant? We were there for nine months. Nine months. Okay, so it was pretty short then, pretty short. And then you moved to a slightly different community. To West Dallas, then, with your next restaurant? Yes, completely, completely different community. So the reason we chose West Dallas, well, not only we were residents of the city at the time, but uh, Mayor Bell uh, at the time from the city of West Dallas came over to the restaurant and she said to me, you know, you should really move to the West Dallas. You should consider our city. And I'm like, when we close shop, I called her and I'm like, I think we're ready. I think yeah. we're ready to look for a new direction and you know, she got me in touch with City Development and Patrick Schultz was amazing. Um, and uh, Sherry, who used to work, Sherry mm-hmm. Sankey, who used to work mm-hmm. at Wibbing, actually took the time to drive me around the city to show me different sites and what would work best for us. And we had our hearts set on the first spot that we saw that was a beautiful brand new building and we went with it. <laughs> beautiful. No, I remember that too. So now tell us a little bit, since it is the Wibbick Cooking Up Business Show, tell us a little bit about your interaction with Wibbick in terms of, you know, not only hopefully the good people helping you along the way, but, you know, specifically the services, the education, maybe some of the loan programs we provided. Just speak to that a little bit and then we'll get cooking. Absolutely. Well, uh, one of the biggest things that I think that has made me successful and be here today after 15 years is the technical assistance that I've received throughout the years from Living. So from the beginning, helping me build my business plan, helping me uh, do market research, going over the budget numbers with me to making sure that there were uh, actual attainable goals and not just, you know, numbers like I want to sell a million dollars in a month, you know, um, going over all of those needs um, it was great. It was a great support. In addition to that, I've taken a number of classes um, through Wibbick that helped me with QuickBooks, with management, with um, budgeting. Oh gosh, I've taken so many that I can't even think of some of them at the, at the time. But then, uh, of course, I got the loan support. You know, I got the support from, from Wibbick and the city of West Dallas that you guys work together. Mm-hmm. So I got my tuition loans. And another thing that was great when it comes to the technical assistant is that I had a consultant working with me, meeting with me on a monthly basis to review my financials, uh, to help me, not necessarily tell me, but help me identify uh, what areas I could improve financially Mm -hmm. that could make the business more profitable and move it forward. Um, When recession hit in 2008, because we opened in 2006, so we were doing amazing. And then, you know, we hit that wall. Mm-hmm. Um, again, Wibbit was there to guide me and identify different areas, different uh, streams of income that we could have coming in. So the support that has been there from the beginning, it's been great. Um, we were able to pay off um, our loan and it, it was uh, a great celebration on our end. And, uh, and then, you know, uh, 
couple of years ago, we had a yet another bright idea to move <laughs> to a bigger, uh, better location so that we could continue to support the growth of the business. Mm -hmm. And once again, you know, Quibic was there for me to help me with the loans, with technical assistance again, reviewing everything, making sure things were in order, uh, looking at my books, looking at my staffing levels. So all of that put together has helped me really be where I am today, 15 years later. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. 15 years. That's great. Okay, let's get cooking. I already previewed what you're doing, so give us a rundown. Okay, so today we're going to do a Spanish themed menu, and I'm going to do two very quick yet delicious and easy to make recipes. So the first thing I'm going to do is the spinacas catalanas or Catalan spinach. It's a very um, easy to make dish, like I mentioned before, very savory full of flavor in a way that um, you wouldn't think that the, the items go well together. Yeah, I've, I've so had it before. I've, I've had it before. The first time I had it was actually in Jose Andres, who you met, one of our keynote speakers. He's got sure. Jose Andres' restaurant in Washington, D.C. Yeah, and go through the ingredients, because again, like distinguishing factor I saw in your recipe, you use baby spinach, you know, talk about that a little bit. And you use raisins, blonde or black, why? So give us some insights. Yeah. We'll talk about that. And so you know that he's opening up a restaurant in Chicago now? I was yes. so excited when I saw that. Yes. Yes. So, um, so uh, the original recipe and what I prefer to use for this is the Granny Smith apple because it has that uh, bitter, uh, sour flavor. Um, today, however, I'm using um, a gala apple. But okay. I will highly recommend that you stick with Granny Smith just because of the flavors, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit sweeter. And the reason I like the Granny Smith, it balances out the raisins because the raisins are sweet. And um, so when you use the gala, like I'm using today, it's just going to be a little bit more on the sweeter side, which is okay, but we'll go with that. Okay. So the recipe calls for you to peel the apple. I prefer to keep the skin, clean it up really well. And we're going to start by dicing it up. So you don't want to do very small cubes, but you don't want to make them too big because you want to taste the crispiness. So this dish, you're going to have the soft spinach and then you're going to have the crispiness of the apple with the pine nuts. And you'll see that. Nice. So we'll dice up some of the... Great. And I know with pine nuts, you have to watch them every single second. If you just like turn around for one second and have a glass of wine while you're grilling pine nuts, they burn. So it's one of those things they you gotta watch. You. Yes. yes, yeah, yep. but amazing you flavor. Mm -hmm. It's the flavor, yeah. And you add those last and you will see. So we're gonna um, start with the apples first and I'm only gonna do half of it because I think it should be enough. And of course you can cook with your oil of choice. Um, but if you're using, co I wouldn't recommend the coconut oil just because it cooks really fast, it burns really fast. And I just realized I don't have a spatula <laughs> or a spoon, but. Go um, get it, we'll be fine. I'll talk really while you go get it. I Someone's getting it for you. Really okay. Yeah, my amazing husband, Nicholas, is gonna go grab one for me. There we go, he can do a debut, so he can do a debut. So the first thing that we're gonna do, we're gonna add the apples and I'll explain it because it goes really quick. So we'll cook up the apples for about a minute. We're gonna season them with a little bit of salt and pepper. We'll let them soften up a little bit. Then we're gonna add the raisins. So the raisins cook up really fast and they plump up really fast too. So if they start plumping and getting um, too dark, that's a sign that you need to turn your heat off right away. And we will as soon as all those elements are together. Then we're going to add the pine nuts and then uh, some chardonnay, some white wine. We'll, we'll let those flavors mix for a few seconds and then we're gonna turn the heat off completely. Then we're gonna use the baby spinach and uh, they cook better, they're easy to eat and you're pretty much gonna fold them right away. Mm -hmm. Turn off the heat and plate them. If you keep cooking them, they're gonna get wilted. They'll taste good, but they won't taste as good. You want some of that fresh crispiness in there? And um, here we go. Thank you. So we got our heat here going. And I usually recommend doing this in a nonstick pan. These pans that we have are amazing and they work just fine. So, um, give me a second here. Nico, do you want to, looks like my phone might die on us. Do you want to um, find the, here we go. Okay. Yeah, that's 
fine. Just you can keep talking. We'll bring it back. Okay, we got it back. That's good. Yep. And um, again, the baby spinach, I'm a big believer in baby spinach too. It's just softer, sweeter, nicer. I generally use the other kind of spinach when I do more of a, like a spanakopita or a pastanel or something like that. But the baby spinach, it's just so soft, nicer flavor for something like this. Yes, yeah, and that, exactly. You are absolutely right. So we'll cook our apples here for just a minute. We want to make sure they get soft enough, but we don't want them too soft. So just to have a nice little crisp around. Okay, so what that's going on, we're going to put a little bit of salt and pepper. And like I said, this goes really fast. So this dish could be served as an appetizer, which we'll, we have done here in the past. It could also be a side dish or my favorite one, grilled salmon. You put the bed of spinach mm. underneath with eggs and then some grilled salmon with um, with some lime on top and it's just delicious. Okay, good. I never thought of that. I've always thought it as an appetizer, but I like that idea of a base for fish, something just a little bit different and flavorful. And then I think you're using, are you using brown raisins, black raisins as opposed to blonde raisins? I'm using brown. I'm using brown. Okay, so, either I mean, one though, could you? Either one will work. Okay. It will work just fine. So they're a little bit soft and you'll be able to smell it a little bit. So kind of like when you're making that nice apple pie. So what we're gonna do next, we're gonna add the raisins. And this is where you're gonna have to keep an eye on the flame. And I always recommend, no matter what you're cooking, start at a medium heat and work your way up as opposed to going backwards. Good. So the minute this, the raisins start to plump, whoops, we have one jump out. <laughs> So once it starts to plump a little bit, and you'll see that it take about 30, 40 seconds, then we are going to add your pine nuts. And again, we're gonna give it a few seconds. And, and are you using white bit. wine? And I'm assuming that's a, a dry white wine. Once you do that, you turn your heat off. Okay. Once you turn your heat off. Okay. Okay. And okay. Sid Lolly, again, a dry white wine you're using, dry white? I'm using Chardonnay. Chardonnay, okay. So again, yep. more in a dry, not real sweet, but sort of semi, okay. So now you got the flavors and you're gonna see that your um, apples are gonna start to brown a little bit and that's perfect. So you have the heat of the pan, you have the walnuts giving it just a little bit of brown crust without burning them. Then you're gonna add your spinach. And this is when I say it goes really fast. You already have the heat off. It's just the heat of the pan of the ingredients and you mix them in really well. Nice. That's so really an elegant better. and elegant dish. Yeah, I love that. So, so we're gonna use this plate. And like I say, you know, it's so such a flexible dish and you can eat it as an appetizer. Try it with the salmon. You will absolutely mm -hmm. love it. Good. And is this on your menu, Sid Lally? Yes. Okay. So we'll add the spinach. And then you have to make sure you put the spinach at the bottom because then you're going to have the heavier ingredients like the mm -hmm. pine nuts and the apples go on the top. Great. And this is pretty much how it beautiful. looks. Beautiful. Like beautiful. Just cool colorful, flavor. beautiful, warm. Love it. Now, this is a it's great healthy. dish. It's very healthy, it's very fresh. It's, like I say, it's flavorful. And you can see the spinach, they cook a little bit, but they're not wilted. So you'll uh -huh. taste some of that crispiness too. Uh -huh. So it's definitely a, a great dish. I highly recommend it. And you can even take it a step farther by making uh, a butter with the pine nuts. So you grind some pine nuts, kind of like a peanut butter, but with, um, with the pine nuts. And then you put it around the plate. It gives it a different taste, it will elevate it. And if, um, you're allergic to pine nuts, you can always substitute for a different nut. I will not recommend peanuts, but something like a walnut mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. then um, um, almonds as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I would say almond would be a possibility too. They have so many almonds also in Spain, so that flavor would be uh, appropriate. Absolutely. So the next one is classic Spanish dish, right? Gambas al ajillo. Gambas al ajillo. So it's another fabulous dish and very easy to make. Uh, notice the paper? Okay. So we're trying to um, figure something out here because my, it looks like my phone is gonna die pretty soon. <laughs> so hold on, we'll put that over here. So for the gambas al ajillo, one of the things that you have to do, we grab the guajillo, 
uh, pepper and we let it soak so that it soften up because it's dry so we can work with it so that's been sitting here for i want to say about 15 20 minutes and then i cut little strips of it and you will come out looking like this nice and it adds just, a little bit yeah just in case folks don't have that pepper not everybody has those kind of peppers around i do i've got all those kind of peppers around but just in case what could be a possible substitute red pepper flakes you get yeah, exactly red pepper flakes a little bit of paprika a little pinch because it gives it the color and it gives it the the taste so nice. you want to cut it in little strips like that once you're done with it okay okay so then what you want to do and i cheated because i have some done but i'll just cut it up anyway is you want to uh, do not use the store diced garlic it's not going to taste the same but you want to um dice up your garlic very fine and you can do it two ways you can do it diced up or you can do little shakes but if you dice it up you'll be able to taste it on every bite of the shrimp okay so once that's done we'll turn on our heat and again we're going to put a little bit of oil and in this case i'm going to add some of the oil so what i did is i diced up um, the garlic, and then I let it soak for the oil, on the oh. oil for about, you know, a half hour, just so that it gets okay. the flavor, or if you have it there longer, that's fine. Yeah. No, that's a great tip. And for oil, I saw in the recipe, you said vegetable oil. I've generally made it with olive oil. Either one okay? Yes, the only thing with the olive oil is that you might want to cut it in half because it burns really fast, okay. really quick. So, but yeah, no, you'll be fine if you do olive oil. You might want to do a blend with, you know, vegetable, canola, but it's fine. So, my God, the smell. I wish you guys could smell it. But, you know, the garlic smells really good. I love garlic. <laughs> so, what you do, you put your oil in there with the garlic. You put a little bit of the red pepper flakes so that, or the guajillo or paprika. Mm -hmm. So, it gets the flavor and gets the color. And then what you're going to do is you're going to add your shrimp. And I always recommend um, that you clean your shrimp really well, because even if you buy it clean from the stores, it's not always. So I'm, I'm very picky about that. Yeah, definitely take the vein out. It's just a, a sight piece and it just, yeah, you got to take the vein out. And you do keep all the little then, tips on, right? You keep the little tips on it? Yes, I do. Yeah. yeah. So, and then was, again with the shrimp, not a lot of people know that when they buy it, they pay for the size. So if you overcook it, it's going to shrink and then kind of like a waste of what you paid. So the minute you start to see it turn um, orange or reddish, then you flip it over. Mm -hmm. And this is another dish that cooks really, really fast. And yeah, it seems like people overdo their shrimp all the time, especially if they do any kind of boil, they end up rubbery. You know, you really just need the change in the color of that shrimp. Um, to, to get it to get it cooked. They do so cook very added, quickly. We added the wine. Okay. And the one thing we're gonna do next is we're gonna put some lime juice here. Make sure you catch the seeds. And I'm sorry, not lime, lemon. Lemon, good. And then this dish is great. You just serve it up with some toasted bread. And again, it could be a simple tapa, an appetizer, or a main dish, you know, when you serve it with some rice. Mm -hmm. And, and this is so classic Spanish. Spanish. So classic Spanish, I right? Yes. I said it's so classic so, Spanish, you know, on all much, Spanish very, menus. It's yeah. a very classic, very traditional dish. Nice. And as you can see, it cooks up really fast right away. Great. Now the shrimp is looking gorgeous. See that pink color? And that's when you know you want to turn up your heat. Don't overcook it. And here we're going to plate it as if we were doing it as a tapa, serving okay. it as an appetizer. And again, you do serve this in your restaurant too, right, Sidali? Yes, yes, yeah. we do. Great. So people can cook it at home, try it, and then come check it out at the restaurant and see how yeah. well they did. Yeah. So you serve it up. But then we like to garnish it with a little bit of fresh cilantro. So I'll just dice some up. And that just brings up the dish, makes it a little bit prettier. 
Yeah, I barely know how to cook without cilantro and without garlic. <laughs> I know. And all you know what I've discovered that's... through all the years? Uh-huh. A lot of people are allergic to cilantro. And I'm yeah. like, how do you leave that way? Yeah, that is interesting. So and with that, thing. nice. And with that, you could substitute if you needed to flat parsley, right? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. definitely. It's just, just a garnish more than anything. Sure. And if you Beautiful. see all that yummy juice, people think it's oil, but it's all the lemon juice and the white wine. You saw how much oil I put, mm-hmm. but mainly you wanna make sure, you know, you have, and um, if you dice up your garlic really fine, like I was telling you before, you'll be able to see it there and taste it in every bite, but you can mm-hmm. do it shaved too. Good. Yeah, so, that just is, that's begging for a crusty piece there. of bread. Begging for a crusty piece of bread, so good. Okay, as we close yeah. out, these were fabulous. Again, to so everybody watching, we will have the recipes attached for your review, but give us some advice going ahead to someone who's thinking about starting a wonderful restaurant, to someone who's in the business, maybe struggling or maybe a little bit challenged. You know, what are some words of wisdom to leave our audience with? Well, what I usually tell people when they tell me they want to open up a restaurant is, um, I'm like, well, one, you're crazy, but it's fun. <laughs> Two is that uh, you have to be ready to work long hours. It's not mm-hmm. uh, an easy job. It's not necessarily always financially rewarding at the beginning, um, but it's, you know, it gives you a satisfaction as you build up your business. Um, a lot of hours, a lot of hard work and dedication, and you have to build a thick skin because like right now, I just made this dishes for you. And while I might love it, you might love it somebody else will come around and say, this is the worst thing I've ever tried in my life. And we can't be, what you have to remember is that we can't be all things for all people. You know, not everybody's gonna like your dish and that's okay. You know, don't take it too hard because at the beginning it was very difficult for me to build that thick skin and realize that not everybody's gonna like Antigua and the food that I serve and that's okay. You Mm -hmm. know, and uh, just realize that that's okay but you still have to continue to give it your very best Mm-hmm. Uh, unlike any other industry, you have to keep learning and educating yourself and learning about new trends and, and way to make your different ways to make your business uh, better. And uh, mm-hmm. the learning never stops. The training never stops. If you stop doing those things, your business is probably going to stop mm-hmm. as well. That's great advice. You know, lifelong learner all around, not to be so sensitive. Sometimes I say you have to have a, be a Teflon pan. Just let some things roll off that Teflon pan, you know. Good. And your restaurant again, give us quick hours, location. You do catering. You do curbside. Give us the pitch. Yes. So Antigua eats in West Valley, so 62nd and National, right on the corner. We open for dinner every night at 4. Uh, we close on Mondays. So we uh, have a full service of site catering. So we do things as simple as dropping off a lunch at an office, or we do full blown out galas and uh, weddings as well. And uh, we do curbside pickup. So people can call up, order their food, and we'll bring it out to their car. They can come in and dine in. Uh, we also have online ordering. So you can go straight over our website, antiguamilwaukee.com. People can order online. And uh, they can just show up and pick up their food. Or we also offer delivery service. And we prefer you do our delivery as opposed to a third party. Okay. Beautiful. Really great. Wonderful. And I know, you know, your food is fabulous. I've been at your restaurant many times, had much of it catered. Um, You honored us so much by doing the catering for my son's wedding this past summer for the uh, rehearsal dinner. So I thank you for that. Everybody loved the food. So absolutely wonderful. And I did see something fun, I think, shout out today. It depends when people listen to our show. But for this year's Super Bowl, you also have really fun kits to make your own empanadas. Yes, so another thing that we do with empanadas, because we have an empanada truck, is just branded different, no less empanadas, but we have kits, so where people can come in, buy a kit, and you can make your own empanadas at home, or you can just buy and make, you know, uh, from us, pick them up, and it's a great snack for the football, to watch the football game. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Our first show, I think, was a total hit. I learned a lot, a little bit more about you. Definitely a couple of cooking tips that um, garlic, keep it in the oil for a half an hour before. That's a huge tip I didn't know. So thank you for that. And to all listening, um, we will have some great links to information. Again, the recipes that Sadlali shared with us today, but also the links to the Wisconsin Women's Business Initiative Corporation, our website with much information for individuals thinking about starting a business, growing a business, accelerating, all of that on the website and some other specific links for the food and beverage industry. So I thank you so much for joining us. We plan on doing monthly shows, Wibbit Cooking Up Business. Thank you.
Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here with you. Bye.